Um, okay, everyone, I think we're going to get started. Um, just want to welcome everybody to the Business of Design interview series. We're so pleased to mark the 10th anniversary of our CEO, Keith Granite, important book with this series where we are interviewing top designers um, throughout the year on how they've succeeded in developing their business in design. Um, so we know that many of you are already Studio Designer users, but for those of you who are, may not be familiar with us, just wanna give you a bit of an introduction. Um, Studio is the leading digital project management, product sourcing, and accounting platform for the interior design industry. Our fully integrated platform features all-in-one project management system, client collaboration tools, product sourcing, and designer-specific accounting software. Um, for over 30 years, Studio Designer has enabled the world's leading designers to drive efficiency and growth save time and deliver beautiful projects to clients. So before we dive into the interview, just a bit of housekeeping. So we're gonna let Keith and Elizabeth um, kick things off in a second. Um, but if you have questions during the interview, please feel free to submit them by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, as you can see in the screenshot here, and we'll make sure to answer them once the interview is concluded. So with that, um, we are so pleased today to welcome Elizabeth Roberts from Elizabeth Roberts Architects. Um, it's an architecture and design studio based in Brooklyn, New York. Her studio is highly sought after for the beautiful interpretation of historical elements that make Brooklyn living as cozy as it is aspirational. Known as the modern master of the brownstone, Elizabeth and her team work closely with clients to craft impressive residential and commercial interiors. We're so thrilled to have Elizabeth here with us today. So um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and kick it over to Keith to start the interview. Great. Thanks, Rachel. Appreciate it. Thanks, Rachel. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi, Keith. Great to see you. Thank you for doing this. Of course. Um, so for our audience, I'm thrilled to have Elizabeth here with us today. Um, she is a client, a friend, a studio user, and a, a very talented designer um, that is an AD100 designer. Um, and was sort of known for her work in Brooklyn, but with the pandemic, like everybody else, the work has expanded, not just from townhouses, but ground up homes and projects throughout the country. And it's been a very exciting growth time for Elizabeth's office. And so we're thrilled to have you here and just to talk about what this world has looked like in the last, you know, well, since you've started actually, but we'll, uh, We'll dig into some questions. Great. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, you're welcome. So um, what's interesting about your practice, um, which is not 100% unique, we have other clients that have both architecture and interiors, um, but what may be unique is sort of that sort of holistic approach that you've, you take towards design. And I know you also work with other interior designers and um, you know, occasionally collaborate with others. When you first started your practice, were you, was that a goal to include interior design? Um, I don't think it was, you know, I was, I, but I have to say I was doing interior design, not knowing that it was interior design. So, and I think that that really informs, you know, what we do here, which is I don't really know where the architecture stops and the interior design starts sometimes. Um, you know, every building has an inside. And um, I kind of think that it's the holistic approach is thinking about the interior and the exterior at the same time. And so I, I, I know that um, really focusing on the architecture when we first met was really what you were doing. And then suddenly it was like, well, everyone's asking me to do all their interiors. And now it, it has everything to do with, you know, buying a sofa as much as, you know, 
figuring out where a stairwell goes. Right. Um, and so what has that growth been like for you as far as, you know, really encapsulating that within your studio? Uh, it's been great. I mean, the work is uh, so satisfying now that we, you know, are able to talk to our clients about the sofa. Um, but I'd say having that kind of talent pool of interior designers mixed in with the, the pool of architects and us all working together just makes really, really rich, you know, products, really rich homes, spaces. Um, yeah, I mean, I think if you mentioned that when we first started working together, I, I really didn't consider myself an interior designer. I don't know, it was sort of like, it was a foreign concept to me. I thought there was so much I didn't know about interior design, and there is. Um, but I'm, you know, when you immerse yourself in something, you learn that, you know, you actually do think these ways. You just didn't have the language that they taught some of my interior designers in school. There's a lot of things I don't know, and I lean heavily on for my, you know, talented interior designers. But um, it, it's also, as I said, I feel like this whole kind of line of interiors and architecture should just be blurred. Um, mm -hmm. I really like not, not distinguishing um, between the two much. So when you've had projects that have been a third party or another interior designer on your architecture projects, do you still have the interiors group um, sort of integrate with that at all? Yeah, I mean, I have to say we're doing that not very frequently anymore. Yeah. Um, I just, I find the process to be so, uh, so seamless for our clients that we can, you know, talk about furniture while we're talking about, you know, a new house. Mm -hmm. And we don't have to start all over once we've designed the house. We don't then talk about furniture. Um, so, yeah, I'm not doing that as often, but I'm open to it. I mean, certainly. Yeah. And, um, and if so, then, you know, what we have to do is really clearly define the line of what we're doing and what the other team's doing, because I like the interior designers to work on the architecture as well. So we just have to be very, the interior architectural space. Um, but even space planning, I find like many of my interior designers are the best at laying out plans, honestly. Um, so, you know, we just have to be very clear when we're working with another interior designer that we're gonna be doing say the finishes in the kitchen and you're gonna be doing the finishes in the bathroom or um, you're not doing any finishes, you're just doing finishing. So that's, that's how we have to approach it. That's great. Uh, do, you, um, do, you, do you find that um, the interior designers are, are working well with the architects? And I mean, because you can't like, and nobody can point any fingers when it's all under one roof. Right, I do find that. I mean, let's see, I mean, I think if I could, back up a little bit and talk about a time when we didn't have as many interior designers in the office. Sure. And my clients, you know, would either hire someone or maybe they themselves were really good at interior design. And so I, I like to think that all these projects are just one big collaboration with the client and the designers and, and me. Um, but some of those projects were furnished beautifully. Um, and not just the furnishings, but also the finishes. The client was able to have this really intense dialogue with me and the architects in a way that we created something really unique. But that's not every client. You know, right. and a lot of clients don't have that ability or that interest. And so without the really creative client who loves finishes and furnishings, um, it, it, it's, it was hard to recreate some of these projects without the interiors department. So interiors comes in now and just kind of turns everything upside down and we start fresh, you know, in a way that architects, we have talent, really talented architects who, um, you know, they, they'd much rather think about kind of the, the nuts and bolts of how the building's gonna be put together. Um, so it's just, it creates great stuff. That's great. So do you find that you're actually having clients come to you first for the interior design sometimes, and then it leads into architecture now? Yeah, certainly. Yeah. I think, well, you know, and I usually tell clients if, 
if they want me to do the furnishings and they think that the house or you know the, the space doesn't really need much architecture, I'll say, look, you're 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 missing a great opportunity to um, at least get my impression of whether it needs renovation. <laughs> so sometimes they'll come to me thinking they just want furniture and a townhouse in the West Village started that way and it's completely gutted. <laughs> <laughs> And we're doing the furniture. It's like, so. be careful what you ask for. Yeah, it's okay. It's a great project, but yeah, yeah. they really right. thought they just needed furniture at the beginning. So let's just talk a second about the, sort of the evolution of the, the firm, because you you did get your name sort of being this Brooklyn architect that did amazing townhouses and then the pandemic hits. And suddenly you're getting calls you know, I want to do a ground up house, I'm moving to this city or that state. What do you attribute to that happening? Uh, it might have something to do with pandemic, but I, I don't actually think it does. Hmm. I think, um, I think I'm finally at a place, I mean, I'm a, I'm a real grown up now. Um, and I'm finally <laughs> at a place in my career, I think where people trust to do things that I haven't done before. Mm -hmm. So I think the portfolio, the happy clients, the whatever it is, the exposure, um, all that adds up to, I think, a, a level of trust that we'll do something new together. And I, I also, so I think it's sort of experience. I think it's an amount of, the amount of experience that we can show that we've done good work repeatedly. Clients are pleased with what we do. Um, yeah, so I think that's a big part of it. Is, is some of the work um, repeat clients that you did a townhouse yeah. in Brooklyn and they're like, well, we have a second house we want you to do. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, we're doing a lot of houses out east or upstate New York, outside of the city. Um, but, you know, I wanted to mention, I've also had people say, you know, we, have, we want to hire you to do our ground up house. We want to hire you to do this other type of work because you haven't done so many. We, we feel like we'll be doing something fresh. Um, we want to do, we want to be involved in the process. You don't have a, you know, a real style yet that we'd be signing on to if we were to hire another architect perhaps. So I've heard that too, which is really interesting. Yeah, that's great, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. Uh, well, that, that comes down to trust. They, you know, completely trust you and therefore they're willing to, give you the opportunity to do something from right. ground up. Right, and so I think that trust comes from just experience and a portfolio, right? So where's what's the furthest you've done a project from Brooklyn? Uh, the furthest? Well, all sorts of, I mean, we've done projects in, in California, Los Angeles. Um, we did the Rachel Comey store on Melrose Place. Um, oh. But, you know, we're just, I, I'd say that the specific project type that we're kind of really good at, we've, we've been talking to someone about a London project, mm -hmm. um, a townhouse in London, and we're about to start a project in Boston, a townhouse in Boston. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, some of the projects we're working on right now that aren't, I don't know, they're not as far away as London or Boston or Los Angeles feel like they're farther away because they're the tippy top of a mountain in the Catskills, you have to drive and you know, little winding roads forever to get to. So, <laughs> we so they might as well be in like yeah. some far flying right. city, right? Right, right. It's real, it seems really far away. And I, and I know you've done some retail and other types of projects. Are those more challenging or? I'd say you, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I made a decision you know, a long time ago to focus my practice on residential work. Mm -hmm. um, after I'd done a few kind of offices for, you know, um, businesses and, and I really just really enjoyed the personal interaction of working with a family or a client of, on, on their home. Um, and I just wanted to focus on that. And then I believe what happened is people liked the homes and they thought, wait, maybe a commercial space could feel that way. So we approach the commercial projects the same way we do the homes. I don't have a separate team that does commercial spaces. It's the architect who did, you know, one house is now working on a store with me. That's how it works. Um, 
And what was the question? Do I prefer one or the other? I this is a more challenging. More challenging. Yeah, I think, yeah, I, I do think so. And I, maybe I, I'm only taking on the, the very challenging ones too, because I'm very, I'm pretty selective mm. about the commercial work because I find it is, it requires so much, um, so much time. And, uh, and so, you know, the, I've only done a handful of restaurants and, you know, fashion retail in the past few years. And those spaces were, you know, for a restaurateur who'd never had a restaurant, for a, you know, fashion designer in New York who'd never had a store, and another fashion designer in New York who'd never had a store. So, you know, really kind of getting in there with them and creating a unique space for them that they don't even have the words to describe yet is, is challenging. Do you have any of those projects on um, what we used to call the boards right now? <laughs> yeah, I do. I have, uh, yeah, a West Village um, fashion. Nice. And um, yeah, right now that's, that's what great. So switching gears a little bit, we um, I know that recently you've been designing some furniture yeah. um, and getting some product out there. Is that something that you see as a future growth opportunity for the company? I mean, it's definitely fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think I can retire off of that, though, um, yet. I don't know. It's not, a, you know, I, the, the woman that I worked with, um, Susan Clark, who owns Radner, and, and she's a really beautiful person who approached me with this project. And I think because of the way she presented it, at the way she presents all of her designers, um, it was really attractive and easy and fun. Um, but I, I really, I haven't thought much about doing more for anyone else recently, but I'd definitely be open to it. Um, but, you know, doing our first, our first pieces of furniture as a studio, um, it was a different exercise. It's a very different exercise. You don't have a client who is you know needing to stop pay i can't be paying two mortgages or whatever those deadlines are that are so important to your clients the furniture was just a departure from you know deadlines it's just sort of sculpture and fun and um, really selfish i felt like you know it reminded me of going i did some art classes after graduate school in architect after my second year in architecture and um I just remember I was talking to my instructor all the time about like, do I actually have to show this to anyone? I just loved how personal it was, you know? And in architecture, we have to talk so much about, you know, sustainability, it's gonna stick around for generations to come. And you wanna be very responsible with your resources and, you know, all that. And um, so furniture felt really just like a departure from all that. Right. Well, you know, it's it's a point of view. It's your point of view instead of a yeah. client's, right? Yeah. You, yeah. So it, it really has your your handprint on it. Yeah, and it's a, it's sort of like sculpture, you know. I I think how it felt. Yeah. That's good. Well, I'm excited to see them in person someday. Yeah, yeah, but we're doing we are doing more product. Um, we're working on some wallpaper right now. Oh, um, so. Yeah, that's fine. It's fun to, to, to create new things that you haven't done before, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, and I think the, the most success people have from product are really creating things that are really holes in the market that you can't find. Yeah, that's what we did for with uh, Radner. Mm -hmm. She asked me to furnish, you know, with her line and wherever there was something that I couldn't find in her collection, we designed it ourselves. Yeah. Oh. And do you design furniture for your clients? You know, just like one-off pieces? We do, them? yeah, we do. Um, typically it's sort of large upholstered kind of pieces that are just hard to, you know, get the exact size and shape that, you know, a room requires. Right, right. Yeah. Um, like everybody, I'm sure you're finding some challenges with lead times and oh, long right. things are taking right now. I know, yeah. but I'm yeah. also finding that people are, are very patient, our clients um, good. across the board. They, yeah. it's, it can't be helped, right? Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're not alone. I mean, everything out there, I mean, from rental cars to plane tickets, it's, everything's a little crazy right now. Yeah. Um, 
Ikea, in fact. <laughs> one, of my, one of my architects was about to have a baby and I said, just go get that crib at Ikea. And she said, they're all gone. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> Well, besides the pandemic, there's also been a baby boom. So exactly, you know, those things combined in a global global shipping crisis, right? Exactly. Yeah. So tell me how you would describe the best client. The what? The best client. Oh, the best client. Well, we have had these conversations in the past, <laughs> and you know, I I know it was you were the one who started me thinking about what is the best client, and it's really important. Thank you for that. Um, the best client is is definitely somebody who trusts you, mm -hmm. right? Um, that kind of second guessing your motivations and what you're up to is does not work well when you're you're trying to create something that's complex. And um, so trust is really important. Uh, another another aspect of an ideal client is that they've done this before. So, built a house or renovated a property. Um, it's really helpful because they kind of know what's involved and there's a huge amount of work actually even for a client. Um, and, you know, the other thing that we'll get out of the way in our first conversations with our, our potential clients is um, just make sure that they can afford what they want. Um, so they have an appropriate budget. Yeah, and I can't blame people for not knowing what things cost, right? If it's not your industry, then how would you know? So oftentimes, you know, we have to really educate people before they even hire us. Mm -hmm. Important. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I think trust is is the number one thing because they don't, if without trust, they don't let you do your best work and you're always being challenged and it's just not fun. It's not fun at all, right. I know. Right. I mean, we could add on to the list of what makes a good client, but we, you know, right. great if they have a, a great sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, you know, but those aren't required. The trust. Do you think you've gotten better through the years at, you know, sort of vetting those clients? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and there were many years when I didn't have a choice to vet. I had to take whoever came my way. So. Right. <laughs> new privilege <laughs> exactly and it is a privilege to really it is. Choose. yeah definitely so let's talk about studio a little bit um, yeah. since that's why we're all here um so you've been using the our program for a while and how do you think it's helped your office be more efficient and what do you hear from your designers who use it yeah. regularly oh i um, i hear great things i mean in fact i don't hear much which i think is great it's a good <laughs> things are working no i mean it's 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 definitely um just kind of night and day in terms of the amount of time that is required to keep track of orders to um you know very efficiently create invoices and proposals so i'm just yeah again it's sort of silence over there in terms of you no know, problems um but I'm also, you know, we have one woman who does all of our purchasing um, and proposals, and she's able to do it on her own for the most part. You know, for big office at, at times we have, you know, probably eight projects that she's purchasing for at a time. So yeah, it's it's a it's a game changer for us. And, and it gives you remote access to it yeah. right yeah the other thing to mention is that she has moved to connecticut so she's actually mm -hmm. doing all of this um in a different state and yet all of the interior designers in the office have access to the program so mm -hmm. if for whatever reason they need you know some really important information it's at everybody's fingertips which is incredible yeah yeah I mean, I think that's been the reason for our growth over this period is they need us to work remotely. And right. so right. You know, we're about to reach 10,000 users, which is really incredible. Oh, great. Yeah. Uh, so one of the things that we're looking at, which we think is important, is a mood board. Mm -hmm. And I know you use some kind of imagery or, or mood board to communicate with your client beginning. How would that be helpful to you if it was somehow integrated uh, with studio um i mean it would be 
it'd be really helpful not to have to enter the information on the mood board and then enter it onto the, um, the proposals. That would be huge. And yeah, I think it would be great if the integration could be somehow more of like a hyperlink. I don't know. That's sort of something mm -hmm. I've been thinking about with my, my team because we really love our graphics to look a certain way. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it would be just one fewer step and one fewer kind of chance for, for error as well. You know, if you present something to a client that caught and you say it costs this and the lead time is that. And then we once we make the proposal, you have to type it all out again and you don't present the same information. It'd be, it can be a really huge problem for our clients. And us. Yeah, I mean, I just from an efficiency standpoint to load up what you want your clients to consider. And then if they say yes, by simple a simple click, it moves into studio and then it, the processing begins. Yeah. It's awesome. But it is important for us that the mood board allow for, you know, everything from, because it is called a mood board, imagery and inspiration. And that if it's an image of a river or a, you know, uh, you know, a painting that you could still have that, but also next to it would be the products that you want the clients right. to have. Right. Right. And drawings too. Yeah. You can put drawings up there. Right. I think it would be great. I, I don't know what you have in mind, but I think it would be required that we'd be able to pull, you know, from our own resources for those yes. needs. Um, yeah, and I think anything we would build would be protected that way so that you could pull your own resources in and right. Sounds obviously great. it wouldn't be shared with anybody. Yeah. So we're doing some research now, whether we're going to build our own or align ourselves with somebody who already has a good mood board. Great. So stay tuned. Um, so, you know, you and I have talked a lot about this through the years about, you know, the evolution of the company. How do you see your practice evolving or continuing to evolve oh, in years to come? <laughs> I know, it's something I'm not real good at. Um, I kind of live for the now a lot. Right. <laughs> um, you know, I think one thing that's definitely happening is that I have some, you know, associates, people who've been with me a long time, um, who, you know, are, are just becoming incredibly great and independent, you know, independently working designers. So I think sharing, you know, a bit more of the kind of the responsibilities that's happening slowly. Still my name on the door for a little while longer. <laughs> um, but yeah, bringing, you know, bringing in, just just handing over some responsibility and, and some fun to others. Um, you know, I think we're at, we're at a size where like 22 right now. And it's you and I have spoken about this kind of sweet spot um, for you know management. It's a really nice size. It's still, we're still you know very close knit group, and um, so I don't really imagine. I don't imagine being much bigger. We well, just went through a major expansion for your space. We have yeah a lot more space and not that many more people, so <laughs> it's feeling really good. Um, yeah, uh, but I feel like I should, I should give you more information about how I see this evolving. You know, I, I'm, so let's see, for many years, you and I keep, we've been talking, you keep asking me, have you been here? Have you been there? Can you go on this trip? And, and I've been so busy working, you know, I've been this, uh, I love my work as part of it. That's part of the problem. But this year I went on a trip, you know, an organized trip to Copenhagen with some other designers and I was so inspired. Um, so, you know, I, I think that we'll all benefit from getting out a little bit more when everything is a little bit back to normal again. Um, but I think that the business could evolve that, you know, in a way that we could all kind of get away from our desks a little more. Yeah. Be great. I think once uh, we <laughs> feel really comfortable climbing out of all of this, that yes. that, yeah. that will happen. And, and I'm definitely getting you to go with me in the spring. So we'll talk about that some other time. Okay. <laughs> but you needed that sort of taste of inspiration to yeah. you know, recognize that. Um, yeah. But it's true. I mean, I hear it all the time that designers 
get their inspiration from travel. Mm -hmm. um, talk to me about where you find your inspiration. Um, well, there are travels, I think, huge. Um, yeah. I really, you know, I really love being in a space more mm -hmm. than added in the book. Um, and so, you know, hotels, not that I necessarily, um, you know, perhaps I'm not, I'm not finding inspiration in the faucet they use or anything like that, but just kind of living in another space is really helpful, you know, when you're coming up, when you're designing homes and designing spaces to have, you know, spent three days living in an incredibly long, narrow room, like knowing what that feels like, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I really, so travel is kind of one of those unique opportunities to kind of live in different spaces. Um, and where else do I find inspiration? You know, what I don't do is I really try hard not to find ins inspiration on social media. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's sort of force fed information. And I like to go out into the world a little bit more. Um, but I know that a lot of people who work with me find beautiful things through social media. So I, you know, we, we've, we've adopted this practice where when we're beginning a new project, we all shred. So the entire team, you know, the junior architects, the junior interior designers, me, everybody in between, um, and people bring, you know, ideas to the table. And I find those, those days are kind of mind-blowingly fun, you know. What? I never thought of that. I never saw that. So that's a really inspirational experience for me, too. Well, you know, I always say that we're stronger as a team than we are as an individual. Gosh, I know. I'm so, I'm so touched by that sentiment right now. Um, yeah. You know, we're doing a lot of work that I find personally very, um, I have to kind of, I'm learning a lot right now. I'm doing, I'm doing really challenging projects and I couldn't do it without these people mm -hmm. in my office. I just could not. Sometimes I just need someone to sit with me and like listen to me think. You know, like mm -hmm. it, even just talking out loud instead of thinking in your head or putting it on paper, just sharing that with somebody else is so helpful. Right. Yeah. Well, being a good listener is certainly part of your job. I mean, you have to listen to your clients, certainly. you have to listen yeah. to your staff. Yeah. Um, I think that there's nothing more rewarding when somebody comes to you with an idea that you didn't think of yourself that is just going to change the project. Right. And every time, you know, when you, when that happens and it percolates up, it's, it is very rewarding. Yeah. I don't know if I've told you this, Keith, but one of my, somebody who used to work with me has become one of my dear friends. Um, she once said to me, Elizabeth, you're the yes, yes and architect. <laughs> really? <laughs> I guess, and she has an acting background. So in improv, you know, you basically always answer with yes and, and you right. say no. Um, but I, I, that is the truth. I, I really, I like kind of far flung ideas that I never would have come up with and then building off of that. That's great. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. For our audience that's listening to this, it's, you know, there's this thing about yes and versus yes but. And whenever you say but, it negates everything that was just said before you. And yes and builds on the idea. So that's perfect for what you've been just sharing is that. Yeah. You, you like to build off of other people's ideas and, and help your ideas actually germinate. Yeah, you know, I think that has a little bit to do with even working with old buildings, which is something I, I love doing. It's sort of that, yes, here it is, and let's do something incredibly right. different to it, you know? I like the kind of problem, right. the diving board to jump off of kind of thing. Yeah, I love hearing that. Yeah. <laughs> And, and it's true. I mean, I, I think my uh, privilege of working with you has always been that you're open to ideas and you're always learning. Right. And I think we all have to live a lifetime of learning. Um, otherwise, you get stagnant or you just get full of yourself. Yeah. Um, and I think that's really great. Thanks. Keith. You know, I was thinking about um, I have a 12 year old son. And so He's suddenly at an age that I can remember really well. Oh, um, you um, being 12, you mean? I remember being 12. Like, it just, right. I feel like I'm still, not 12, but I feel like I'm still 20, 
you know, yeah. 25. Um, but I, you know, I just, I, 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 I really remember that age and I still feel, you know, I don't know. I feel like I've got so much to learn. Mm -hmm. I, I forget how old I am. I'm not 12 and I'm not 25, <laughs> but I, I don't feel as old as I am. Yeah. I'm open to all sorts of new things and suggestions and learning. No. Yeah. It's good not to feel your age. <laughs> um, does he have any interest in design? Yeah, you know, he told me yesterday, he said, Mom, have you ever designed a houseboat? I said, yeah. a houseboat? He said, I think you should really design a houseboat. I said, why? He said, because it's so cool. You get to live in it and you're floating. And I'm like, All right, so he, he is interested. He thinks about yeah. it a bit. And at one point I said, maybe you'll have to take over the business. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he likes that, especially when he walks in the big office and right. starstruck. <laughs> <laughs> so you do need to share with him. I think it's it was published in AD. Is Bjorki Engel's houseboat? Oh yes, in oh, in Copenhagen. I saw them when I was in Copenhagen. They're beautiful. Yeah, yeah. yeah they're like a, just a stack of containers. For is that what you're talking about? No, that the, that's a project that he did. But he yeah. actually his own home is a houseboat. Oh is yes, casting that in AD. Yes, that's beautiful. I, I will show them that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. if um, so before we open it up for questions, I just one last question for you, which is, um, is there anything product projects that you have not had the opportunity to design that you would love to? Certainly there is. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Where do you want me to start? Um, no, I don't. I mean, I have been working toward, you know, kind of some sort of a hotel, you know, would be really fun, but I'm, I'm really open to, to new challenges. Um, so I, I wouldn't even know where to, this conversation, we could, we could talk for a week. It's a lot right. of stuff. <laughs> well, I agree with that sort of lifelong learning. It's like, if a challenge came your way, you'd probably want to take it on. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Um, Not prisons, probably. Not prisons, <laughs> okay. <laughs> if someone comes asking for a designer for a prison, I'll know not right. to call you. <laughs> I do hear a lot from designers saying hotels would be great. And one of the reasons I think it is, especially boutique hotels, where it becomes a calling card that somebody stayed there and you know, then they want to hire you. But it also it's very residential driven, residentially driven. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it sort of makes sense versus some of the I was I had a dinner the other night with a bunch of designers who are coming on our trip to Monaco, and they said um, they don't love working with chains because with a chain, you know, and it could be a Ritz Carlton or a Four Seasons, which can do beautiful work. They have so many requirements and it becomes more and more difficult to actually be creative. Oh, yeah. Where if you find the smaller boutique hotels, um, or like you said, someone who's never had a shop or never had a restaurant, right. someone who's never had a hotel would be like a really awesome client because they're much more open to, you know, ideas and expansion. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be fun. Well, let's see if we have any questions out there from our audience. So I'll read some. Um, first is from Eden. Could you ever see yourself shifting from having an in-studio design team and to really collaborating more so remotely as you delegate some more of the responsibility to members of your team? So does that, is, I wonder if that means, um, yeah. I mean, I, I guess I, my mind goes to pandemic <laughs> and how we were doing that remotely. Um, and it's, it's so rewarding to be in the same room. Um, and to throw things on the table and to draw a line if we're going to see it and to turn the trace upside down and hold it up to the light and show the mirrored version of what you've been talking about. And, um, but yes, I mean, I've also really learned how to do that remotely. So um, I, I am open to it. Yeah. I think we've also talked about the fact that you love having people in the office. I mean, yeah. it's just, you, 
I don't, you know, I think one of the things we've learned through this uh, working remote situation is that creativity doesn't happen over Zoom. You know, it really happens because you're tra tracing or you're drawing with somebody or you're sharing ideas. Right. And I think we're, mi we're missing some of that. Um, yeah. So as much as there's a lot of efficiency you can have with, like you said, your expediter is living in Connecticut, yeah. that can work perfectly fine. And we've learned that. Right. But when it really comes to collaboration, which is a big word for you, um, I don't know it have, if it can happen remotely that well. Yeah, I and mean, we found ways. Right. You know, the architects and I, when we were, I was just stuck during pandemic on this really big project for me. And it was, I think, Friday night at nine o'clock. I had my glass of wine and made this cocktail. And we had this, this program called Jamboard. It's like a Google product and you can both draw on the same tab. You know, if you open a tablet with a pencil, we could draw together. Wow. So we found our ways. Yeah, but it, it would be much better to sit at a table next to each other. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, the next question is from Catherine. Um, she'd love to hear how you started out and built your business. So what were some of the biggest challenges in your early days? Mm. Uh, where should I start? Um, you know, I think one, one, one thing that comes to mind is that I started very small and I stayed very small for a long time. Um, and I actually worked out of my home for many, many years. And um, as a result, I, I didn't have to take on projects I didn't want to take. So call it my overhead was nil to none. Um, and I think as a result, I really built a portfolio that I loved and that, and that brought me work, you know, that I loved because people already saw what I loved to do. So. Um, I think just starting slow and small worked really well for me. Great. Um, we have another question from Reagan. So how do you foster growth and talent with designers you work with? And what's your advice for being a great leader? She's asking, as a designer who just started her own firm and has admired um, your work and presence in the industry for many years. Oh, that's nice. Thank you. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's mentoring is where it's at, in my opinion, at, at least at my stage. Um, it's so important and not only because for the obvious reasons that that's how people learn once they get out of school. Um, and we all deserve to have incredibly rich careers. Um, so, you know, um, mentoring is so important. But also, um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I think one of the things that we do really well at this office is I try hard to, you know, really fully respect everybody um, and remember everybody's goals. Um, so we, as I mentioned earlier, we do this collaborative process where we all, you know, all the junior designers, the entire team of, you know, it could be 10 people. Um, really sit together and brainstorm. And, you know, I, I can remember recently, one of the most junior architects solved the most complicated project or a problem in a project um, during one of these meetings. So, and then, you know, say thank you and um, point out when somebody does something really great that wasn't your idea. I'd love to give people credit. Um, so I hope that was helpful. Answer the question. Yeah, and I, just to add, Elizabeth, I think you've been great at, you said this early on, you know, sort of building this team is being able to delegate and give more responsibility for people. Yeah. And again, it goes back to trust yeah. and, and allowing people to grow within their, their roles in the, the company and promoting right. people as they've achieved a certain level with you. And I think that that's what it helps you evolve is making sure that people feel like they're in a learning growing environment. Right. And, and, you know, it, as a, as, as I've noticed with many people who start out small and grow, 
it's hard to let go and, and, and really trust people. And once you get there, it's freeing and allows you to really grow. Yeah. And, you know, with your help, Keith, um, you know, this team model that we have in our office, but, you know, it's Keith has helped me a lot. <laughs> um, we don't learn these things in architecture school. Um, how do you run an office? And one kind of basic fundamental kind of things that makes this work, this office work is you, are these teams. So there's always a junior architect who develops a really great and, or junior designer and junior designer, they develop a really great um, relationship with, you know, a se more senior staff and they work on all their projects together. And um, I think that team structure is just that kind of, you know, knowing who you're going to be working with, they know what you need to work on, um, you know, that's really helpful. And it, it, it helps me tremendously to know that, ah, that entire team is, I can set them off and let them free. They, they've done this before, they know how to do it, that kind of thing. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, so this is a connected question, honestly. Um, you know, what do you do as a principal and owner to retain employees? And I think some of this you already answered, but keep that strong company culture, especially amidst the long hours in this industry. Yeah. Well, it's nice not to require those long hours. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's nice to, to, I really, really respect and, and talk about my own need for a life outside of work. Um, it's, there's, you know, one life to live and it's not all going on in the office. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think the office culture is, you know, I really, I really like people to feel healthy and feel good. Um, and I think that means you need to leave at a decent hour whenever possible. Um, but also, you know, have some fun at the office. So, um, you know, whatever, Whatever it is, we, we do, you know, events and that type of thing and try to have some fun together. We do, um, we take trips um, outside of the office together to do some sort of design related activities. And it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important group that we can do so many things other than just work together. And, and so we do. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's probably it. That's probably the best answer I have. For that. Thank you. Um, we have another one from Margo. I'm such a fan of your work. Can you share with us maybe the most interesting historical detail you discovered in one of your projects? Mm, boy, I don't know. Uncover some hidden treasure. Yeah, that's from my attic. <laughs> ever found. Well, no, actually, in one of our townhouses in Brooklyn Heights, um, during excavation, it was right behind Plymouth Church, um, and they found some tunnels oh, wow. that have been part of, you know, like an underground railroad times and, you know, hidden kind of way to get from this townhouse to the church, which was a safe haven. Um, so that was pretty fascinating. Yeah. That's probably the most. Like, I don't think I can talk about that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you shut down the tunnels? Well, there was a historian at Plymouth Church who, you know, wasn't surprised and had written a thesis. Someone, in, I think, at Columbia had written a thesis about um, this house because the house was used for, um, you know, the priest kept people there um, and they were allowed to live there, slaves. Um, so I don't remember what happened with the tunnels, but we did, we told everyone we could about, about it. Yeah. Documented, yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Great. That is really interesting. Yeah. Um, another question from Rachel. It's not from me. <laughs> um, so this might be a good question for your team too, but, you know, how do you use studio designer in your workflow and how do you kind of use studio designer in conjunction with other tools or you know 
solutions within your office? Well, we use Studio Designer primarily for um, keeping track of furnishings and things that we order for um, interiors. Um, I know there's a really powerful component for invoicing as well that Studio Designer has. Um, we use a big, big, heavy, clunky program, but that really saves a lot of time here that um, is called Ajira. But we, um, but Studio Designer is just incredibly helpful at keeping all the complex finances and orders um, really well organized. Yeah, we do find that um, many firms that are do both architecture and interiors um, need a more sort of robust time billing uh, to track their architectural projects. And they use Ajira quite a bit. Um, and one of the reasons in our long list of development future projects is to actually increase our time billing sort of capabilities so that you wouldn't have to use two different programs. Right, right. Yeah. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, and this is back to kind of team and your office. What are the most important qualities you look for when you're hiring a new team member? Oh, um, boy, I mean, it takes all types. So I don't think there's one particular quality that is most important. I mean, I really like, I like, I like to hire people who get along with each other. <laughs> Although it's not a social club. Um, you know, so, so I find people's skills are pretty important. And I think, but you know, some people are, are a little bit more shy than others. Um, let me, is that, that's not a very good answer to your question. Um, I mean, a good designer, somebody who can design is really important. Um, and even in the, the really kind of junior applicants, you can tell often by just their presentation um, a lot about how they kind of organize their work and see things and present things. So, yeah. You know, I think, I mean, the word you used earlier, which is collaboration, mm -hmm. and you say, you know, whether the people like each other, I think. Are they good collaborators too? Um, I did notice, Rachel, I think we have time. We can squeeze this question in because I thought it was an interesting question um, yeah. that said, um, what do you do as a principal and owner to retain employees and keep a strong company culture? How do you keep strong working morale amidst the long hours of our industry? I think right. that's a good yeah. one. Well, I mean, let's see. I think I mentioned it's good not to keep people at the office all the time. <laughs> um, how do, what, what is the question? I feel like I answered this question, Keith. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, it's just like keeping a, a, how do you keep a strong morale and encourage your employees? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think having, giving people a voice, making sure that they're heard. Um, um, I, you know, it's easy to just spend one's entire day looking at this light box on your desk. Um, and, and, and that's no way to live. Um, so, you know, I think, I think meetings, you know, and, and keeping everybody involved. Um, I, you know, I like to encourage that we all do things outside of the office as well. So, yeah, I just had some junior architects house sit for me and I told them while I was in Copenhagen and I said the requirement was if they're going to house sit for me they have to have the entire office over for a barbecue and I said okay oh. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah I don't know cool. bringing the dog to the office is good people like the dog <laughs> <laughs> uh, I yeah. don't know. well even if you know you look behind you and you can see you know, how, I know that's half your office but it's you know, it, it is an environment of collaboration. It's open, people hear each other. Yeah. I think that that really does help. Um, and I know you have like every Monday or used to, I don't know how it's blasted through the pandemic, but where you get around the 
the table and the conference room table and just talk. Right. Yeah, we have we like to meet every other week, um, just all together and kind of talk about the projects. Not, you know, not every single detail, but what is it that we could help with? What is it that someone at the conference table might be able to help with? Right. I think we're out of time, but this has been awesome. And I really love seeing you and talking to you. And yeah. this, I really appreciate you being a part of this. Of course. Thanks for asking me. It's nice to see you too, Keith. Yeah. We'll see you soon, actually. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm just going to take you. things back over just to close things out. Thank you so okay. much, Elizabeth. This has been Thank you. fabulous. Um, so, of course, just want to give anyone the opportunity to learn more about Studio Designer. Um, email us at info at studiodesigner.com or join our live demo, which is Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern. And we have a few exciting interviews coming up soon. We have Ken Folk um, in November and then another with Suzanne Tucker in December. So um, lots of exciting things to come. Um, thank you so much for joining us and have a great rest of your day.